It's great to be here with you this morning. We've got a great crowd. And, uh, and I was thinking about this, you know, this title, um, Why Herbicides Sometimes Fail. And I was also thinking, well, you know, the, the pro side of that would be that uh, we can do things to make sure that they don't fail. And so I guess that's kind of the pro side of maybe this lecture. Um, so uh, let's kind of go through it. Oh, how many of you are aware that this is um, uh, National Pesticide Safety Education Month? Uh, this February. Yeah, there you go. I got, I got a hand out there. So if you haven't Googled that site, I would recommend that you Google that site because I found it a quite a useful site. So, so it's not too late to go to that site and interact with all those little plus signs over there and brush up on uh, uh, safety, uh, safety protocols for pesticides. Many of you know that I do um, some fruit work with the team over at Upper Marlboro, the Research and Education Center. And of course, myself, Ben Beal, Herb Reed, he's retired now, Joe Fiola, Chris Walsh, and others have uh, done some things, and mainly to transition the tobacco farmers uh, over the course of my 22 years with extension into other crops. And so we've had peaches over there, and apple blocks is a fire blight block. Uh, vineyard team was pretty successful. Um, blueberries, and so, you know, even beach plums. So it's kind of fun to, and I've got a meadow orchard over there now, and there's Ben harvesting beach plums. And, and so the new meadow fruit, and even played around with um, uh, mixing fruit. And so having you know, some pretty neat projects, even played with hops. They had the first hops yard in Maryland for the University of Maryland at Upper Marlboro. So uh, this, these fruit crops are not for the weary, that's for sure. And so I look at these, this concept of failure, and I kind of, real quickly, I've got more slides. It's a very ambitious slides uh, show. So what I'm probably gonna do is uh, make reference to, I put it online. So if you go to the Anne Arundel County website and go into the slideshows, you'll find the slideshow is online now. And, but the first thing we have to think about when it comes to failures that we typically see is we don't recognize um, uh, um, the label well, we didn't read the label well, and we don't recognize the difference maybe between burn down, a pre-emergence product, and a post-emergence product. And they're all quite uh, different in their, in their approach to application. Also, something called rain fast. How many of you are aware of rain fast? That, that period of time that's required before rain occurs, very difficult this year <laughs> uh, to, to get a product out there and have rain uh, not wash it off and make it less effective. Um, but rain's also important too for making it effective, so we need a, we need a balanced approach. Um, incompatibility, I thought we'd mention that with tank partners and things. Sometimes we think we could just throw everything together and have good results, and a lot of times we're working against ourselves when we do that, especially with herbicides. And then key weeds are not on the label, so you've got to pay attention to that. Of course, we have our burn down products, and uh, you can see uh, Roundup, very important one, and uh, you know, that's one that I recommend we shield. Um, here's a slide about Rainfast. It, look, look at Gramoxin and Roundup Weathermax, or one of the, the newer varieties of Roundup, um, even the generics now that have the translaminar surfactant technology. You notice Rainfast is half an hour. That's pretty incredible. Um, and you, you also notice I have the old 4L formulation down there. See what that says? Six hours. <laughs> that would have been really tough this year <laughs> um, to burn down some vegetation. You know, when we use a burn down product, um, we're probably going to mix a pre emergence product with it. We get no burn down activity if it gets washed off before it has a chance to be absorbed by the plant. Thankfully, uh, Gramoxin and Roundup, the Weathermax varieties, uh, these, these surfactants are very quick now. And we didn't always have that luxury with the old 4L. But you'll notice that the more post-applied products, um, and Liberty has four hours, which we rely would be in that uh, chemistry of glufosinates and, um, for, for fruit production. And four hours, that's lo much longer than a half hour. So we got to keep that in mind. Uh, we get a good shower, and we wash it off, and we won't get activity. Um, same with a lot of our post products, highly variable. Uh, so you need to look at each label specifically. And I just put a few up there that are, are post-applied. Uh, like post, aim, and matrix. And you can see it varies from one to six hours. So we need to pay attention to rain fast periods. Uh, rain fast also is temperature dependent. And so a cooler weather, you can lengthen that period of time. And so that's always important. The, um, here's our rely product, our glufosinate. Again, another burn down product. And then gramoxin, the other burn down products that we would typically use. And uh, of course, the label changes. We mentioned that, I think, last year a little bit with the label changes. N95 respirator, NIOSH N95 respirators required the, the dust type, mist type mask. And uh, there are some new dilution uh, factors for backpack spraying. So we still have the label for that um, um, in our fruit production. So we can still apply it with small backpack, backpack sprayers, but we have to watch that dilution rate. So here's a kind of a nice picture transformation of taking a peach block into apples. You can see the grass is coming up, and now you're starting to see some herbicide activity in the row of the apples. 
and then that's about a four week period. So nice transition using herbicides to burn down and pre-emergence products. Um, the other, I don't want to leave out some of the organic burn downs. Um, they actually do work pretty well. Um, uh, Avenger, Axe, Scythe, Burnout, there's several, uh, Burnout, the label, uh, they use that Burnout label for a lot of things. Every time I look, at on, look up online a Burnout product, it's got different active ingredients. So I don't know how they quite get away with it, but they got a Burnout, a Burnout 1, a Burnout 2, a Burnout Pro, and all of them have different active ingredients. This particular Burnout was citrus and mustard oil, citrus and, no, citrus and clove oil citrus acid and clove oil. Avenger is a, a D-limonene oil, it's an extract from the ci citrus industry, and Axe is anionic ac acid and Scythe is pelargonic acid, and they actually do work pretty well. Uh, so usually two applications on weeds that are two to four inches tall, you get a good burn down out of these products. So, so they are, sometimes it takes a repeated shot, um, but you actually can use those uh, to burn down um, unwanted vegetation and even crop cover crops that you might want to slow down. This issue of incompatibility is something we need to think about. There's kind of three levels of incompatibility. There's antagonism, and that's when you put uh, two ingredients into a tank and uh, actually in, maybe inactivate one of the, one of the part tank partners. That's really critical with grass control products like Post and Select. If you put a broadleaf control product in there, especially one of the, um, like a Reflex or some of those type of products, uh, the PPD products, you'll notice that um, you'll get a decrease in grass activity. So be very careful. I always like to put my grass control products out singular and not throw, the, throw something like uh, uh, AIM or some of the other broadleaf type products, post products in there. So incompatibility is always an issue. Potentiation, that's when the uh, put two pesticides together and you actually get toxicity. Now what we typically see in potentiation is the toxicity is toxicity to the crop plant, right? So what we're talking about is injury uh, to, the, to the plant that we're trying to <laughs> protect, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with selectivity. And so potentiation in this case, we might find that um, a lot of the sulfonylurea products, the only one that comes to my mind for fruit is Matrix. Uh, you wouldn't want to use an organophosphate uh, within a period of time, probably within about four weeks of that product, or you could see injury. Probably not so much to trees, and, but maybe at early planting of some of our small fruits, you might see potentiation issues. Uh, and then there's physical incompatibility, and that's just when you happen to put things together and they just unwanted results chemically and so you end up with oatmeal or something in the spray tank now you have an unsprayable mixture and um, here's just a kind of a there's a lot of different rules out there I think they used to call it whales now they call it wham legs and this idea of, of mixing uh, things that are harder to mix first and working your way down to the easier products and then always put your fertilizers if you're going to put fertilizers in there uh, you know, the calciums and diff different sprays in there, always put those in last. They, they tend to uh, uh, cause binding and cause incompatibility issues. So here's just a picture of herbicide added uh, uh, to uh, the spray solution where the fertilizer was first put into the water. And so complete incompatible spray mixture. And I've seen that with um, 2,4-D, especially when you have a UAN solution, you want to put some nitrogen with a little bit of 2,4-D and, and then you put the UAN in the tank and you put your 2,4-D in and you've got real troubles on your hand. And just uh, this oatmeal just foams up and you got, holy cow, how am I going to spray that? And the only way to get something like that sprayable again is a lot of hot water and a lot of agitation and a lot, a lot of frustration. So, uh, you, you know, so if you do that to yourself and you got, you know, a couple hundred gallons mixed, you've got some real troubles. Um, just, the, just the order, just the sequence is all that's required. And that's where a jar test is so important when you're mixing, especially new chemistries. You know, put that little teaspoon in that jar, give it a shake. And then think about your order, write down the order that you do it in, and you know, kind of think like a chemist, I guess. Um, the second th failure that we typically see is um, timing of the herbicide to the control of the targeted weeds. The, um, uh, you know, the burn down is, when we think about burn down, in this case pre-emergence and post, we really do need to understand uh, the difference between this. And so uh, looking at uh, sometimes the targeted weeds might be cover crops. They might also be, you know, early spring weeds that we're trying to control, winter annuals, those type of things. And uh, so knowing when to target our burn down and also how we're going to get our pre-emergence down, targeted down to the soil. We don't want our pre-emergence hung up in the cover crop or the vegetation of the weeds. We want it in the soil. So pre-emergence, we're always talking about some type of soil band of chemistry that's going to give us some activity for six to eight weeks. If it's hung up in the, red, you know, the residue or vegetation, we're not going to get any weed control out of it. So we've got to get that so pre-emergence down in a band in the soil. And then, of course, post-emergence, it's also about timing. Uh, what size is that weed? Is it actively growing? 
you know, and so making sure that we have an always um, three to four inches, really one to two is probably better, but three to, actually two to four is probably the best range. And then, but once we get above six inches, we start to lose control of our post control products. And so that's uh, unfortunate. I actually put together, I got three handouts in the folder for you. And one of them is this new one here that I, I spent a little time putting together a few weeks ago uh, for these talks. And I, you'll notice I put the burn down products, the pre emergence products, pre pre and post, that means they have pre-emergence activity as well as post-control activity, and then our post-control products. I left out Allion and Casteron, of one, typically ones I talk about. I'll probably add those later. Um, but you'll notice I put some other interesting things on there that I think are very important. I put the low rate, so that's the low rate. Now I always consult the label for specific applications because I'm not going to break this out by fruit right now. This is just what's labeled for most fruit. And you'll see that I put um, this number, K, this K coefficient, the KOC. That's a coefficient of carbon. It talks about the affinity of a chemical to being adsorbed to the soil. Um, so it's basically a very important measurement of how well, how tightly bound that chemistry is going to be built um, bound to the soil. Now, where would you find this information? You don't find this on the label, so where do you find it? It's that other piece of document by law you're supposed to have with the label when you spray. What is it? Safety data sheet, right? You realize you're supposed to have both. You know, how many of you carry both? <laughs> How many of you carry the label, right? Are you supposed to have the label in your pocket or on the clipboard with you? And you really do need the safety data sheet. And the safety data sheet, I think, is more valuable in a lot of ways because it gives me information like water solubility. How water soluble is that product? That has a lot to do with how I'm going to get that product into that soil and what level that I want it for my control, as well as that K coefficient, how absorptive it is. And then looking about, I think soil half-life is very important. Now, that, I took some liberties. There's a broad range of half-lives in soil chemistry. And so I just took an average number. So I took what was in the, in the literature, in the safety data sheets, and in the handbook, the Weed Science Society of American handbook, at average length, and that's the average days that you can anticipate under good conditions with good moisture, good temperature, that would take for these products to break down. And then I also put some notes over there. So that's anyway, that's for you to kind of peruse through later as we think about how to use these products and tar get them targeted very specifically um, to control those weeds for us out there. We'll talk a little bit more of that as we go through with that, that particular slide. I also put in the multi-fruit spray guide sheets. So you got the updated ones for, for your small fruit and tree fruit, and then that uh, new herbicide, uh, common herbicide uh, chart. So here's our, our, our standard um, pre-emergence products that we might typically think of using out there. That's actually a Princep application early spring before uh, that was put on there, right, right at green up. And, and peaches, and you can see I uh, put some gramoxin out there with it, and uh, probably a little Devernal. So nice little package up front to give me that first four to six weeks of weed control. Right? Uh, we recognize that there's no there's no one spray program you're going to spray at the beginning of the year and not have to walk away and worry about weeds the rest of the year. I think you're all aware of that, right? It's typically three to five sprays at the at the usually five is what I typically think of as a good spray a spray program for herbs for our fruit work. Um, but anyway, you can see the products, and I also put uh, on the notes on that sheet for you, I put the, the times of the year when I prefer to use them, whether fall, whether spring, whether dormant. And so I think, and the real, the real crux to that is rotating these different products. You also know I put the FRAC code in there, right? So, or the uh, HRAC code, the Herbicide Resistant Action Committee code. So again, a lot, into, a lot, a lot goes into this, right? And of course, here's, um, here's uh, Surflan with a gramoxin a little bit, you know, as we're starting into uh, you know, this, this a little bit later in grapes when we get into bud break, probably the end of April there, thinking about crabgrass and some of those type of things that we're targeting with a product like Surfland. You could use Prowl. You got, you know, each one of them has a little bit different PHI, uh, but they're all also uh, pretty important. Here's Solacam, another, another one that actually has, uh, we have to worry about this one. It, uh, it has a pretty good broad label for going in there, um, even into the early summer period, well, we have to worry about swirling that up into the canopy. You can see it's a carotenoid uh, uh, synthesis inhibitor, and you get that nice whitening. does a real nice job. Nice thing about Solacam is it controls sedges as well as broadleaf and grasses, so it's got kind of broad spectrum. Here's our post. We might use that. And knowing that we're shooting at some crabgrass, or not crabgrass, uh, Bermuda grass there. And then sometimes you have some of these products like AIM and Shark and Venue. Um, that we're targeting chateau, maybe targeting some of these chateaus earlier, but these, these three can be used right up to harvest time. And uh, they're nice because we can knock down some of these uh, tougher broadleaf uh, weeds. And I uh, actually did a little bit of work with Venue a few years ago and was pretty amazed. It did really well 
on Greenbrier, which is my, one of my nemesis in horse nettle. I don't know, maybe you have trouble with those too. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you do. And uh, I thought, you know, pretty, pretty good in a smart weed. And I thought, wow, anything that hurts mulberry a little bit is kind of worthy morning. of mentioning. Yeah, morning glory is a tough one. It does a great job on morning glory. So those annuals uh, are especially um, nailed. In fact, anything with 100% means basically I didn't see them again. So that's kind of nice. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty, good, pretty good thing. Uh, failure uh, number three is um, uniform herbicide application or disruption of the herbicide barrier. And this has a lot to do with the pre-emergence. Also, a uniform uh, burn down application too. So we get a you know, nice uniform burn down, that vegetation that's already there that we're trying to control. The weeds are already growing actively. Pre-emergence products typically don't kill those. So when we think about pre-emergence and we put those in the soil, they, they don't really kill an established weed, right? They're inhibiting those young seedlings and right at germination time. So um, the big thing that I see with this is sprayer setup. Um, poor nozzle selection, poor sprayer setup, poor calibration. We see, get into a lot of troubles by talking about a nice uniform layer. So when you think about spraying, think of yourself as kind of like, I used to like to think of myself as that field is a canvas and I am the master painter. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to just, you know, put this beautiful application across there. It's going to be picture perfect. And the same thing, it's going to have all that herbicide, you know, spread just perfectly across that field, laid down just as even as, as, uh, as, as can be. And we can do that with sprayer technology and going out with the proper timing with the weather and th things of that nature. Um, poor calibration, incomplete um, post-emergence herbicide activity. Um, uh, is really critical with the post-emergent projects, you know, getting a nice, again, that nice even. What happens if we don't get the pre-emergence down through the canopy? So how will we do that? We might use coarser drop nozzles, use larger droplets to get uh, as much as we can down through a canopy to the soil with a pre-emergence product. Uh, so again, a lot to do with that sprayer setup. And we might come back and do some disruption, even, even uh, foot traffic in our orchards and vineyards and small fruit can disrupt that herbicide barrier. You know, if your heel digs in and you turn sideways and you kick out like a little divot, more than likely you've just exposed uh, weeds then uh, to take right off because that herbicide band's typically only about an inch thick for most of our pre-emergence products and we got to get them right in that, in that zone. So sp spend time. Um, it's real important uh, if you get into some boom uh, sprayers that have more than one nozzle um, to make sure each nozzle is putting out exactly the right amount. Uh, they do vary a lot and so uh, with spray, big spray booms when doing ag agronomic work, I would look for output on each nozzle from boom to boom and all that kind of, so it's very important to make sure your sprayer is set up right. They're not always set up right from the, you know that, don't you? You buy something new, <laughs> believe me, it's not right, it's not right for the factory. Sometimes you got to put compensating valves in there to get the differential uh, pressures between booms and so it can get pretty complex, but do your calibration. I thought this was a good slide, it pulled down off a T-Jet because it shows the real importance of some of these new uh, turbo T-Jet air induction Venturi nozzles and uh, this whole new range of any of our contact and you put your contact herbicides and all your post control herbicides, you're gonna wanna have those medium droplets up there. Um, so Liberty, uh, Gramoxone, and all your post applied products, you're gonna wanna use something like a turbo T-Jet, okay? Or, 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 back, or back to the old standard flat fans to get good thorough coverage with a droplet size around 350 microns to 400 at the most. But when you get to where you want to move a pre-emergence down to the soil or with a product like um, uh, Roundup, they actually want you to use more coarse droplets. And so, and then the Rely is kind of somewhere in the middle because Rely, in order for it to kill a plant, a glyphosate, it has to cover every growing point. Now Roundup, that's not critical. It translocates so well that if you get enough of it on the plant, it's gonna move around the plant, even to the roots, right, and get your killing. But glufosinate doesn't work quite like that. It's moderately systemic. And so you really do have to get some on each growing point. Of course, Gramoxin, you need to cover the whole plant thoroughly. And so that's where droplet size really does matter. And changing those, don't be one of those ones that sets up a sprayer for life, right? Okay, <laughs> you really do need to have a whole range of different nozzles if you really wanna do this right and be selecting that nozzles and that delivery and the amount of water sometimes to get down through some of your canopies, weed vegetative canopies and those kind of things. So, so really become adverse in the, this nozzle technology. Um, the fourth thing that we typically find is we don't fully understand the chemistry of the herbicides and, and certain, certainly in regards to the mixed water. So here's when we're mixing in the water and a lot can go with wrong with our mixed water. 
And, uh, you know, if we've got well water, you know, we've, everyone knows that every well is a little bit different, you know. <laughs> and they have a, a lot of different problems potentially. Water pH can be an antagonist to herbicide activity, especially pH that goes above 7. So we want to, thankfully most of our waters are typically acidic out of the wells, but you want to make sure they are. Uh, that range of about 5.5 to 6.5 is more ideal for most of our weak acid herbicides, which a lot of them fall in that range category. So, so if, if they are, if you happen to be up on that upper end, 7 or above, you're going to need to put an acidifier in that water. Okay, that's very critical. The, and sometimes water that we get from municipals, they actually have it, to, to, they have it above that 7.0 layer. They put the sodium hydroxide, they get it up too high, uh, the pH gets too high, and you really need to put an acidifier. So you watch that water if you're using municipal sources. Um, water turbidity, that's soil in the water. That's a real good indication of that is you fill up your spray tank and then come back with water. Come back the next morning and you notice that there's a layer of clay in the, clay at the bottom of the tank. Everyone ever seen that? You know, so, uh, so again, that's turbidity. That's the amount of soil. And so good filtration is very important for turbidity so you don't have that. And uh, remember that K, those K, um, uh, KOC numbers? Turbidity means that if there's any soil in there, a product like Gramoxin that has a 1 million KOC value. 1 million, imagine that. That means really as soon as it's in contact with the soil, bam, it's completely grabbed. And it's inert at that point. It's not going to make it into the, it's not going to do anything on the surface of that plant. Okay? And so turbidity, the percentage of the turbidity that you have in that tank could reduce the percentage of that herbicide that you intend to put out there. Also Roundup the same way, turbidity, turbidity amazingly affects Roundup. Water hardness, again, we talk about hardness, we talk about the calcium and the mag magnesium and the sodiums and the irons. Those cations are, that are in the water uh, are what we think of when we talk about hardness. And of course, that's why we th have these required surfactants sometimes to overcome some of these things like hardness and turbidity. And then uh, water temperature. Uh, how many, I don't know how many of you have found that when the water temperature gets down below 40, it's very difficult to mix chemi chemistries. They tend to not mix well. <laughs> so a lot of times I mix things with hot water. If I know my well water is coming out uh, cold or if I'm using surface water that's really cold, then I'm actually putting my chemistry in, in hot water getting it in solution, then getting it in the tank. If not, you kind of get into this, um, this, this kind of swirling solution of just particles <laughs> in the tank. It's not really, you know, it's not really conducive to good, good weed, thorough weed control. So here's just, uh, again, some pH charts. I think I pulled this out of the vegetable handbook. And you can see the, some, of the, some of the products that we might use here, um, having that pH range of around 5.5 five or something that's required. And you see glyphosate's in that range of 5 to 6. And uh, I'll see what's the other one up there. There's sethoxidem is actually up to seven. And um, so again, know, knowing where you need to be on that, it has a lot to do with this idea of weak acid and what we call disassociation in a, in a, in a sprayer tank when the pH gets too high. Here's an example of looking at um, glyphosate and turbidity as well as um, over here, the hard water glyphosate. Unfortunate thing about glyphosate is that with hard water, where we have the, uh, the, the calciums, the magnesiums, and the iron levels that are too high, uh, we actually form uh, very quickly binds to the glyphosate molecule. And so we get a sodium glyphosate molecule or a calcium uh, glyphosate molecule. When that happens, it's completely inert, it will, even if it gets into the plant. So with, if turbidity gets on glyphosate, the, the molecule will never get into the plant. Okay, because the soil will just won't allow it to go into the plant. Now, with, with a, if a sodium happens to get on it, it will get in the plant, but it's completely inactive. It does not bind the ESP synthase. Um, that is how glyphosate's active. Okay? And so you, even though you get the glyphosate in the plant, it's completely inactive and more likely to be metabolized before it becomes active because it's bound tightly to that cation. So how do you overcome that? Well, you use, and oh, here's a good example. If you took distilled water and took glyphosate and mixed it in distilled water, it would be a clear solution. It might be a little bit yellow because gly glyphosate is a little bit yellow, but it would be clear, okay? But if you put it in hard water, fairly hard water, it would immediately start to take on that milky looking characteristic, which means all that that's bounding and basically refracting light um, is essentially unavailable. So, and so you can actually, you actually, there are formulas that you use and we use ammonium sulfate for that particular reason. We want to bind the sulfur to the cations in the hard water solution and we use a certain amount of ammonium sulfate and it's based upon the hardness of the water. To, uh, we, there's actually formulas for that to know how much ammonium sulfate. And then the ammonium, which is a cation, binds to glyphosate and it's not rendered inactive. 
So you're kind of getting a two for one there. You're kind of getting an enhanced activity as well as you're binding up the sulfur of the cation. So ammonium sulfate is very critical for, especially if you have hard water. So if you know you have hard, hard water, use a softener and uh, use ammonium sulfate and you'll see a much better re reaction out of that. The um, fifth thing, failure to understand herbicide chemistry with regards to soil and microbial interactions. And here this goes back to that concept of half-life, what's happening to that herbicide when it gets in the soil, I want my pre-emergence activity to be six to eight weeks of control. What happens if I only get three weeks and why? You know, did that happen even though I maybe got it in the soil where it should be and I got a nice herbicide layer of activity? And it has a lot to do with microbial in interactions. Most of these products are broken down microbially. If they're, up on the, if they're left up on the surface, then UV light cleavage is probably going to be a big part of the breakdown of this chemistry of most of these chemicals. And so, but we understand that we don't want them to last forever ever either. We want them to degrade over time to the duration that we need them. And so it's a good thing that they break down microbially. They actually are, if we look at uh, all the products that we're looking at here, are, are uh, organic chemistry. They have carbon. And if you look at the constituents of, the, of each one of these chemicals, the microbes will feed on them, okay? And so they're benefit to the microbial communities. And there's also a predisposition, what we call a soil predisposition. When that happens, we actually have microbes that are just there waiting for the herbicide, okay? Like, okay, feed me some more of that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dever and all, that's pretty good stuff. I had no problem eating that, right? And so you get a predisposed microbial population. That's why we want to rotate these chemistries too. So we avoid predisposition of microbial and try to enhance microbial uh, populations uh, that are different. And so we understand all that through these concepts of soil adsorption, water solubility, half-life, and so again, very important parts of understanding this whole microbial degradation pathway. And so uh, and that's why products work. They may have worked when you first used them for six to eight weeks, and all of a sudden you're using them every year, and you notice they don't work for more than three or four weeks. Okay. And always soil moisture, especially um, soil moisture and temp with warm temperatures, enhance microbial activity. So we had a lot of, mo we had, I don't think we had a period too long without much soil moisture out there last year <laughs> with good temperature. Uh, there, uh, we did have a drought, uh, a little hard to believe, we had a little mini drought there in June, but we don't remember that part of the year. But we certainly remember the warm part when most of these herbicides would have been applied and fairly rapid breakdown, even though we may have had the herbicide in the right, right position in the soil. So um, there are some really nice uh, charts that show you this idea of uh, solubility versus soil absorption. Um, and then basically a, a product like, interesting, I, I put up here the ones that are very low water solubility. And that doesn't mean that uh, when they're mixed with water and they're on the vegetation that they won't wash off readily. But once they get in the soil, um, then uh, because they're in with carriers in, in solution and, and they'll, they'll readily wash off the residue but, and then they'll get in the soil and then especially the ones that are strongly absorbed they're really going to form um, hopefully that barrier right there and that we try to get it about one inch at the one inch to one and a half inch level that's about where most of the weeds are germinating and so understanding that it takes a certain amount of water to get it in that, in that zone, and then if, whether if it's highly absorbed, like gold, surf land, princep, prow, and treff land, um, they're not going to leach. So those heavy rains are probably not going to leach them out. Uh, they'll leach them slowly, but they're not going to wash them out once they get to the soil, which is nice. That's why we choose some of those. Um, and so, unfortunately, though, the wet, warm conditions might lead to rapid breakdown. But, um, but sometimes we, we, we get a heavy rain that actually washes it. We lose uniformity. So we, we, get, uh, we put the product out there, we get a gully wash in rain, <laughs> and now we never really got a herb effective herbicide barrier. It just kind of all washed off with the surface water, and we got concentrated pockets of, of chemistry and not a nice herbicide layer. So what we want, what we really want, is we want to apply the herbicide, these pre-emergents, especially these strongly absorbed ones, we want to get it down through the canopy, right? And then we want to have um, you know, just enough rain to get it right into that soil zone that we're looking for, that sweet spot that's going to control weeds. And so that's a lot to wish for. <laughs> sometimes you might want to set up a sprinkler set, you know, and help things along uh, to make sure some, sometimes if weather's not conducive for that. Actually, um, gold is so tightly bound uh, and so uh, insoluble that uh, actually if we, we don't want to do any tillage at all with gold, uh, we want to spray it on typically in the dormant period of the year, good broadleaf weed control, um, and if, if it gets into that soil bam right where we want it, we don't want to disturb it because the more we disturb it, the less active it actually becomes because we just bind it up even more 
uh, and so fracturing that basically that soil soil band of of activity. Um, temperature is very important too. Roundup really uh, you want ambient air temperature 60 or above. The sweet spot 60 to 75 degrees for that. Anything below 40 you really don't want to use Roundup. You'd probably be better off with Cremoxin. So again, this is time of the year Cremoxin would be much more. The um, failure to uh, incorporate herbicide timely, again, we kind of talked a little bit of that, about that already, but incorporation, if it's required, is very important. Pre-emergence uh, incorporation, of course, incorporation might be using an irrigation set, um, or it might be doing some light uh, shallow herring or so, of some of that nature to incorporate. I thought that it was really critical um, that, and, and herbicides that are not incorporated, some of them within seven to 10 days are completely degraded by UV light. So a lot of the labels say they have to be like dual, if you ever looked at the metallicor, five days. And if it's not in the soil within five days, it's probably degraded. Uh, you probably lost more than half or better. And so you're, you're losing chemical every day that you're waiting, right? And so labels are pretty much saying, yeah, after seven days, we're not going to guarantee any weed control out of this product, is what they're probably telling you, especially under high intensity UV light. Now, we don't always get that in the spring. So, you know, degradation is a part of uh, UV intensity. Now here's out, took a picture out in, that's uh, Robert Madavi's vineyard uh, in Sonoma. And uh, I, I took it because, I don't see, there's a guy over there, they were actually cultivating. So they were using a combination of cultivation. I, my guess, I didn't ask them, but I would imagine they were probably cultivating in something like Casseron, a product that has to be cultivated in, right? So again, to get good effective weed control. Um, failure, again, um, uh, too much rainfall causing leaching. And again, those products that, that are more tend to, to move will, will have that problem. And so we want to, we always want to, and sometimes that rainfall leads to a more a conducive environment for breaking down and shortening that half-life period. So that's, that's really critical. I'm uh, running a little short on time, but uh, just a couple more points. Uh, failure to um, uh, properly apply uh, and store your, your herbicides. Uh, make sure, you know, these products have a life expectancy. And I pulled this, uh, this is right out of the uh, vegetable um, newsletter out of Illinois there. And I like that because they put questionable Quality questionable after freezing. And if you notice there, some of the ones that we typically might use, Prowl, Prefar, Roundup, and so uh, 2,4-D, Treflan. So again, we want to avoid freezing. How do we do that? By inventorying products, putting dates on them, put a little heater in there if they need to be. I took a picture of Mosca in Uganda. I found this little uh, Kakuta trading store, and I, I came a frequent flyer <laughs> because they had everything I wanted in there, and they had it in small packages, which I thought was really great. I mean, if you, anytime you can buy this nice little package where, you know, we, we don't get the lugs. We have to buy two and a half gallon jugs of everything. They had everything packaged real nice. And I thought, isn't that great? Uh, you know, so we, maybe we just need to encourage our industry to package things um, that we would have better shelf integrity and shelf life. And so I thought that, of course, that's, that's Paraquat, 2,4-D, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, Gramoxone, Paraquat, 2,4-D. And every chemical you can want, I even found carbofuran in there on the shelf. I thought, wow. That's pretty incredible. The, uh, <laughs> so failure to rotate chemicals and, uh, and also uh, um, the families, that's really important too. So that's that HRAC. Make sure you rotate those chem chemical families. And of course, I put the FRAC codes in there for you on the, on the herbicides on that sheet. And there you can see the FRAC codes. And uh, last thing is failure to observe herbicide failures. <laughs> And so I think that, uh, this is actually in Uganda. That's actually my daughter over there sitting with me in Uganda a couple years ago, and Chuck Schuster from over Montgomery County. And we had a farmers there, and we were talking, and we were talking about record keeping, we're talking about uh, forming clubs and forming, you know, kind of groups and kind of pay attention and observe things and find out what your troubles are and, and work together on that. But sometimes just failure to recognize that is really critical. Make sure you sign up to Veg News um, and, and get the latest information coming out. I think I just saw a new, I can't remember the product, but some, I got something in the mailbox about a new product label for spotter and lanternfly that just got an um, emergency section label on it. So, so I know there's a lot that's going to be coming your way during the growing season. Make sure you get veg and fruit news. And that's it. Mike, questions? Any questions for Dave? Dave, you had a nice slide up there with the keyword wham legs. Yeah, there you, you go. put it back up or uh, I probably can. explain what wham legs is because it was a mixing uh, Very good. Spectrum from wettable powder by like this sulfur is the last one. I just want to copy it. I go past it already. I think I did. It was one of the earlier slides you had. It was early, wasn't it? Maybe I didn't go back far enough. There it is. You just had it. Yep. Was yeah, that's that's really. I can't read it from here. Maybe you can read yeah, that's it. really that is very critical. I know um, 
Wettable powders are very difficult to get in solution, so you always start with a wet. What I typically, when I fill a sprayer up, I always do the jar test ahead of time, or at least I know what I'm dealing with, right? So that I know that I'm not going to get any surprises. And then you start mixing um, in the tank um, the water, and then sometimes if um, I might, I might put a little bit of surfactant if I know my chemistry. Uh, sometimes it's not required. And then I get that, I get that uh, agitation going, right? And then in comes the wettable powders. And then in that order there is pretty, pretty standard. That doesn't mean that's absolute, but that's a pretty standard order of how you would mix the, basically the formulations. We're talking about how the product is formulated, okay, as well as some active ingredient. And so that's, that's what they came up with. And I, you can find that wham legs thing anywhere online. But um, I will note that if you're trying to introduce something new to the spray tank, sometimes what, what you want to do is go ahead and mix up your regular cocktail and then pull out a little cord of it and then add a teaspoon of what you want to mix and see how well it mixes. And if it mixes and looks sprayable, you're probably okay as long as you don't have potentiation or some of the other problems. Mm -hmm. Good point.